I believe we've got a very simple test as to whether God exists or not, and that's by judging from this book, which claims to be from the Word of God. And if we open our Bibles almost at random, you'll find some reference to thus saith the Lord God, or uh, God spake to the prophet so-and-so. Throughout its pages, it makes this claim that this is from the Word, this is God's Word. And if God doesn't exist then this isn't a divine book, it is a human record, and surely we'll very quickly discover that it is a human book because it will be full of mistakes. But if God does exist, and therefore the claim that this book makes that this is the word of God, it's not a human record, it's a divine record, then we shall see from its message that this will be shown. And we believe that this is the case, and that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. Or this afternoon, even. Um, So, does God exist? Well, we're going to be just looking at this one aspect of Israel. There are other aspects one could have looked at to show that there is a God by looking at design and creation, looking at prophecy, though obviously tonight we shall be looking a fair bit at prophecy. Prophecy and Israel are interlinked. And one could look at the world of archaeology to show that the claims that the Bible makes are supported by archaeology. So, um, as I say, we're just limiting what we're looking at this afternoon by looking at uh, Israel. And so we want to see how the existence today of a nation in the land of Israel is a proof of the existence of God. So... The return of Israel to their land is a very powerful sign, we believe, and it has convinced many people of the truth of the Bible because the Bible is so clear, as we shall see, that the Jews, though scattered, were to return back to their old land, to the land of Israel. And we're just going to look very briefly at just a few verses from three sections in Ezekiel. The reason why we're looking at Ezekiel was at the time of Ezekiel, they had been taken into captivity. And this was the beginning of the scattering process of the Jews. And so Ezekiel is writing at a time when Israel are about to be scattered. And the message which God gives to him, we believe, because we do believe this is the word of God, is so crystal clear that there is to be a a long future of difficulty for the Jews but it's going to end with the return of them. So let's just look at uh, Ezekiel uh, chapter 11 and verse 16. I've got it on the screen, but if you've got your Bibles, let's open our Bibles as well. But on the screen, I have just emphasized the points I want to make. So beginning at verse 16, uh, God says, and it makes it clear, this is the word of God. This is not Ezekiel dreaming these things up. Uh, Thus saith the Lord God, although I have cast them, the nation of Israel, my people, far off among the heathen, the nations, and though I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. So God is saying that they're going to have problems, you're going to have problems, but I'm going to be there behind the scenes, making sure that you're not eliminated. Uh, I'm going to look after you. And he goes on to say, Therefore, say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where ye have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. So it's crystal clear from these prophets that they're going to go back to the land of Israel. Now, they did do that after the end of the 70 years captivity in the time of Ezekiel. They did go back to the land of Israel and rebuilt Jerusalem but the prophets make it clear that they would be scattered again as indeed happened after the time of the Lord Jesus was here and what these words are talking about is not this imminent return in the time of Ezekiel but a future time which we can see is history because they have already returned to that land after their scattering And the prophet goes on, that's why we can be so confident that he wasn't talking about the return imminently from Ezekiel's day, but some future time. Because as well as God saying, you're going to go back to your land, he also speaks about the great change which was going to come upon Israel. And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. I will take out the stony heart out of their flesh, 
and give them a heart of flesh. And he goes on to say that they may walk in my statutes, keep mine ordinances and do them. They shall be my people and I will be their God. Now, that didn't really happen at the time of the return. Uh, and so we have to say, well, this is the interesting thing for us, that we're living in a time when we can see the partial fulfillment of these words. Uh, and what it's going to lead to, uh, to jump the gun, is the return of the Lord Jesus to establish himself as king with the 12 apostles on the 12, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And in that time, when Jesus is their king and the apostles are their rulers, then these verses about Israel being God's people, being righteous and a holy nation, will take place. But we've been privileged to see the return of the Jews back to their land. And again, I want to make it clear that there is to be a scattering, we shall see in a moment, there is to be a scattering of the Jews from their land again, a final conflict which will uh, cause them to cry out to their God for help. Uh, and that is the time when the Lord Jesus Christ will come to save his people. So just to summarise what uh, those three verses tell us, that Israel is to be scattered, but God was going to care for them in all the places where they were taken, but they will be regathered to their own land. Not to any old land, but to their own land, the land of Israel. And you know that, that those prophecies, Ezekiel was living... Uh, two and a half thousand years ago. So amazing prophecies from a far off time. So Ezekiel chapter 37, just a bit further on in Ezekiel's prophecy, again speaks in similar terms of their return after a period of problems and exile. And again, just plucking a few verses out, verse 21. Uh, and note again the emphasis God is doing. This is God's work. This is God's people. This is God's word. And saying to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen nations, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them... Come on. I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. One king shall be king to them all, and they shall have no more two, they shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more. And again, there's an interesting little addition there that they're going to have a king. And I've already said who that king is, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the original nation was divided into two, Israel and Judah, but in this future time, having been regathered to their land and the problems are going to come upon them, when their king is there, then they will be one nation again. And he describes that king as being David, my servant. He shall be king over them. They shall have one shepherd. They shall walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Now the Lord the um, David was their king, but you know that was uh, 500 years, 600 years earlier. But David means beloved, and so to listen to this in Hebrew, my beloved, my servant. And as I say, when we study Scripture, then we find that who is the beloved servant of God. It is his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And although David will have a, a position of prominence, uh, the Bible tells us the king is going to be the Lord Jesus Christ. And his people are going to walk faithfully and do what God wants them to do. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. They shall dwell therein, even they and their children, their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. My tabernacle to want to move on. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the nations will know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forever. So again, this is God's challenge. He knew that nations and peoples would question whether there was a God. 
And God is saying, and our reading would have been Isaiah 43, and we'll, we'll come back to that. But God says, the Jews are my witness. If I say things about the Jews which lie in the future, and they come to pass, then you will know that I am God, Israel are my people. So again, this chapter tells us very clearly Israel to be regathered, not anywhere, but to their own land. And now we know that they're going to become one nation with one king um, under the beloved David. The next chapter, Ezekiel 38, tells us of this time of trouble for Israel. It describes in the early part of Ezekiel chapter 38 of nations headed by a character called Gog, who's going to assemble many nations to come against the Jews who have returned to their land. But what is interesting is the detail, given, as I say, two and a half thousand years ago, of the state of the land and the people and the area at this particular time. And we've got the great benefit of hindsight and being able to see, yeah, well, now that was exactly what has happened. So that's why I'm just jumping in at uh, verse 8 of this chapter. After many days, thou, Gog, shalt be visited. In the latter years, thou shalt come where? Into the land that is brought back from the sword. So you're going to come down into a land that is described as coming back from the sword. Uh, and we know that the Jews had to battle to uh, build a homeland there. The nations around didn't want them there. They wanted to drive them into the sea. And it has indeed been brought back from the sword. And is gathered out of many people. The Jews have come from all nations of the world. Against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. So the implication was that these mountains of Israel, for long periods, would be waste and desolate. And again, under the Muslims, that was the situation. It's only under the Jews that have returned that the land has been cultivated and uh, supports the nation. And the reason why Gog is going to come against this uh, nation of Israel is to take a spoil and to take a prey. Now, we understand by those two words that uh, a spoil is when you're robbing the goods and properties and that kind of thing, and a spoil is used of people. So for some reason, the Bible is telling us that in these latter days, there is to be something very valuable in Israel, not only in uh, the land, but the people themselves are going to have skills that Gog is going to want to take captive for himself, to take a spoil, to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places which are now inhabited, uh, upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have ga gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. And then uh, just jumping on to verse 16, thou shalt come against my people of Israel. Note that God says of these Jews who had come back to their land in these latter days, that they are my people, uh, as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land that the nations might know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O go, before their eyes. And we're not going to look at it, but it describes how these nations who come against his people and succeed in destroying Israel as a nation and taking Jews captive and robbing them of the things that they have got are themselves to be destroyed so that the Jews can return in peace under their Messiah and King. Now, it's so interesting that the Jews today are so rich and prosperous. They have uh, all sorts of skills which are very desirable to advance nations, their ability to knock out um, radar so that they can uh, attack their enemies. And the skills that they have are absolutely amazing. And we can see, you know, well, that, that makes sense. You know, just from a worldly point of view, it, it would make sense to get hold of these people uh, and uh, use their wealth and their skills. And we know how recently a vast amount of energy has been found uh, off the coasts of Israel, and in fact, on land in Israel. 
and we believe, and again, it's not our subject tonight, but this, this Gog is a representation of the Russian nation because it was a country to the north of them gathering in other companion nations to come against Israel, chief of which is today's Iran, um, Bible times Persia. You know, we, we, we can see that, well, that, that's exactly what they want to do. The Iranians want to get rid of the Jews. The Russians are very keen on having control of the oil uh, that is available. So, you know, the, the Bible is so wonderful. And this is why we believe that the Jews are a wonderful witness, that there is a God who has all these things in control. So it's telling us that the mountains of Israel will be repopulated after a long period of destruction by the Jews, um, but the land is going to be invaded by this Gog. And we have to say, well, you know, if, if God has the ability to say these things, and you know, how else can we explain how a nation has been scattered from their land for 2,000 years and yet returned to it? There's no, no other nation that I'm aware of that has been scattered out of their land over millennia and not been absorbed. That's what happens. People do get taken captive, but they get absorbed. No other nation that I'm aware of has, after a long period of time, revived as a nation. And, and the Jews always hoped that their um, saying was next year in Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, they've been scattered into all nations around the world. But they have been gathered from those same nations so that 43% of the Jewish world population is now living in Israel. Now, the great impetus for that was the Holocaust in the Second World War, when millions of Jews perished. Poland, 2.6 million perished. Romania, three quarters of a million. Russia, three quarters of a million. Hungary, 200,000. Germany, 180,000. Holland, 104,000. Lithuania, 104,000. Latvia, 70,000. France, 65,000. Czechoslovakia, 60,000. Austria, 60,000. Greece, 60,000. Yugoslavia, 58,000. Bulgaria, 40,000. 28,000 in Belgium, 9,000 in uh, Italy, and I must be one ahead. Uh, six million. They're just numbers, but they were all real people. Jews who died because they were Jews. And because of the terrible things happening there, that sped up the impetus to return to their homeland. And this nation, 3,000 years old, 60, 67 years old in our calendar, because in 1948 they went back. But after a period of 2,600 years of scattering, they have gone back to their land. And also, as well as this unique phenomenon of the nation scattered yet reborn, we have the Hebrew language. For centuries, Hebrew was spoken by Jews as part of their study of the Torah, but it wasn't a living language. And it was this uh, gentleman, Ben Hurida, that uh, determined to make Hebrew a living language, introduced all sorts of new words in Hebrew for modern things, wrote dictionaries and that. And uh, as a little quote says, before Ben Yehuda, Jews could speak Hebrew. After him, they did. And you go to Israel today, and they're all speaking in Hebrew, signs in Hebrew. And again, as far as I'm aware, this is the first time an ancient language has been revived to become the vernacular of a nation. Dead languages like Latin, people do speak in the Roman church, Latin, and that, but it's not a living language. Hebrew is a uniqueness. So, in a wonderful way, Israel and I have added an amazing witness to God's existence and the truth of the Bible. How could any human being know this? In fact, these things are here and recorded and have come to pass or partially come to pass is a great conviction that this is the, there is a God 
and this is his word, his record that he has left. I just want to go, and we went down here um, a few weeks ago, um, so just very briefly, I just want to go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, don't turn to it, just going to look at uh, one verse. Um, but we're going back 1,400 years. Now, um, I'd be quite happy if people say, well, you say, Mr. Pierce, that's 1,400 years BC that that was written. Um, I don't believe it was as old as that. Well, it, that doesn't worry me. Because we know that by the time we get to about 250 BC, that the Old Testament was translated into the Greek, the Septuagint version, uh, and we have uh, bits of Dead Sea Scrolls which clearly have uh, Leviticus and other early writings going back to this time. So we know at least 250 years before the birth of the Lord Jesus and these uh, writings were in existence. And, uh, and you know that date's good enough for me for this purpose because uh, what uh, Moses is going to say to his people as he brings them to the edge of the Promised Land just about to die, he's 120 years old, and he speaks to them on the edge of the promised land overlooking Jericho. And in, his, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, he sketches their history of the things that would happen to them, how they would have a king, how they would be exiled, how they would return, how they would be exiled again, and then be scattered to the ends of the earth. And the detail that is given here is, is of such... High quality is the only phrase I can think of. It's so detailed and so exact that it is a wonderful testimony to the word of God. And so I just want to look, uh, I think, at a couple of verses. Um, the Lord God shall put a yoke of iron upon your neck. Now, we know this uh, phrase is used in history books, the uh, iron rule of Rome. Yes, you could say it is true of other nations, but, um, sorry, I should have said that where we come to in this prophecy is the, the time of the Lord Jesus and beyond there when the Romans came and uh, had control over Israel and eventually destroyed them as a nation and scattered them. So, a yoke of iron was a very good phrase to be used of this uh, nation. And put a yoke of iron until he have destroyed you. And it was the Roman power that did destroy the nation of Israel. Finally scattering them in AD 70 and then uh, the last remnants um, in the time of um, Hadrian. But, you know, note this next detail. The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth. And we looked at that last time. But you know that Rome wasn't even founded to be another if we accept the Bible dating, um, it'd be another 900 years before Rome was even founded. So it was a nation from afar uh, uh, coming down. And coming down, it says, swooping like an eagle. And again, we know that the phrase, the eagle, was so applicable to Rome. That was their standard, the eagle. A nation, you, you know, God just doesn't, doesn't really woolly about this. It's giving us layer upon layer of information for us to check and see whether it is true or not. A nation whose language you shall not understand. And Hebrew and Latin just have absolutely no affinity at all. And they would come until they had destroyed them. A hard-faced nation who will not so respect to the old or show mercy to them. Okay, that was true to other nations that had come, but especially that was uh, true of the Romans. They were very tough, seasoned soldiers who uh, didn't care about life. And the result of this coming of this nation from afar, swift as the eagle flies, tongue you're not going to understand, is that you're going to be besieged, your walls are going to come tumbling down. And one could go to Israel, you can see the remains of the temple in the time of Jesus, Herod's done. You can see the stones which have been buried under the debris of centuries, millennia. Uh, they did come tumbling down, and Rome was put to the flames. Uh, and, you know, that, that, that's a remarkable prophecy. Even though that was 250 years beforehand, 
even more remarkable if the Bible writing is true, and that's 1,600 years before. But of course, it doesn't stop there. The rest of the chapter goes on to describe um, sorry, uh, how that they will be scattered from all peoples, or from one end of the earth to the other. There you serve other gods, a wooden stone, which neither you nor your fathers have known. Uh, and one can trace Jews in virtually every country of the world, many of them forcibly converted to Christianity, and just worshipping the idols that uh, were present then in order to save their lives. Uh, and God tells them that in their scattering, you won't have an easy life. You will find no respite. Find no resting place for the sole of your foot. The Lord will give you there trembling of heart, failing of life, failing of eyes and languishing soul. Your life shall hang in doubt before you. Night and day you shall be in dread and have no assurance of your life. In the morning you will say, if only it were evening, and at evening you would say, if only it were morning, because of the dread that your heart shall feel and the sight that your eyes shall see. And you couldn't find a better summary of the history of the Jews than those words there, written so long before. And yet, this people have been gathered back to their land, exactly as God has said that they were being scattered, but God was taking care of them. And in the chapter 30 of Deuteronomy, it makes it clear they're going to come back to their land. Now, just turn to Isaiah chapter 43, which, as I say, would have been now uh, reading if things had uh, gone smoothly, which they didn't. Um, uh, and in this chapter, this is God making clear that the Jews are a witness to his existence. And he is saying to the nations, look at the Jews, see what's happening to them. They are evidence that what I'm saying is true. Uh, and so the chapter uh, 43 opens, but now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. In other words, yes, you're going to have to pass through waters, things aren't going to be easy, but I'm going to make sure you're not eliminated, exterminated. Through the rivers, yeah, you'll go through the rivers, but I won't allow them to totally overflow thee. You'll walk through fire, but you're not going to be totally burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather them from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. In the past hundred years, that's what we have seen. So much so that in 1948 they were able to establish themselves as a state. And there is uh, Ben Gurion reading his declaration, setting up their nation as the state of Israel. Exactly as God has said. God says, I will bring you to the land, the land of Israel. Here is are the Jews in the land of Israel. And in increasing numbers from a trickle in the 1800s to ever-increasing flow with the persecution between the wars and then when the state of Israel was set up in ever-increasing numbers. So there are now uh, just over 6 million Jews in Israel among 8.2 million Israelis. And we can see that it is a very necessary step if God has told us in Ezekiel 38 that the nations are going to come down against his people, well, then we need his people in their land in order that these nations can come against them. So that's what we've seen. We've seen the Jews go back. And we believe that really the greatest event of the last century was the establishment of the state of Israel. And... Uh, that's the herald, we believe, of the wonderful message of the Bible, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we just need a very brief history lesson which shows us why the Jews are so important in the purpose of God. Because the case I've made is that the Jews are God's witness, 
why are God's, why are the Jews God's witness? You know, why are they so special in God's eyes? And that is, uh, we have to go back to the great promises which God made to Abraham, the father of the whole Jewish nation and the Arab nations too. Um, but God chose Abraham, um, the father of the Jews, and made unbreakable promises. Uh, and in Deuteronomy chapter 32, God said, look, when I laid out where nations should go, it, it was all in relation to the nation of Israel. In other words, we should expect to find that the Jews are placed in a strategic place for a purpose, and we'll come back to that in a moment. So the first uh, promise that God made to Abraham, he was in Ur of the Chaldees, uh, and travelled northward to Haran, um, and God said to him, you know, get out of your country uh, from my kindred and come into the land that I will show thee. And when he eventually arrived at Haran in obedience to God's command, leaving everything behind him, uh, he left Ur and arrived up at Haran, and this was the first promise that God made. I will make of thee a great nation, I will bless thee, I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So here God was making it quite clear that this was something extraordinary. God was prepared to deal with this particular individual, and his descendants were to be a very special people. And he travelled onwards until he came down into what we would term the land of Israel today. And when he was at Shechem, he was told, well, this is the land. This is uh, what I've been talking about. This is the land that I'm going to give to your seed, to your descendants, to your offspring. And then he travels further south. He comes to Bethel and says, lift up, God says to him, lift up now your eyes. Look toward the place where thou art, north, south, east, west. All the land that thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And at that time he was on the spine of the land, and he was told to look north, south, east, and west. Uh, this was the land that God was going to give to him. He was also told while he was there that uh, your descendants, and at this time he had no children, he was uh, in his 80s at this time, but... I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that a man can number the dust, so shall thy seed be numbered. Walk through the land, through the length and the breadth of it. I'm going to give it to you. And again, he moves on down to Hebron. Uh, again, God says, you know, look at the stars of the sky. Uh, so numerous they are, so will your seed be. And Abraham believed God, uh, even though he hadn't uh, got a seed at that time. On the fifth promise uh, God made to him, he was told that he was going to die. Abraham would die, uh, and his children would go into another land. But in the fourth generation, they would return and possess the land. And he promised that eventually they would have from the Nile to the Euphrates as their possession. And that came to pass. Abraham um, uh, died, and his descendants eventually went into... Egypt and to Jacob, um, but under Moses uh, came back uh, into this land. And so God was giving promises to them. And the sixth promise was that he will become a father not only to a Jewish people, but many nations. And kings will be born to him, will make an everlasting covenant to be a God to him and his children. And their, that land will be an everlasting possession. Finally, about 17 years uh, later, God made his seventh and final promise when he was outside Jerusalem and again told you're going to have uh, a numerous offspring like the stars of the heaven or the sand on the seashore. But there was going to be one particular descendant who would possess the gate of his enemies and in him all nations would be blessed. And so we need to know who that particular descendant is because then that will link in all that we have said. But these are wonderful promises. And that's why God has never allowed the Jewish nation to be exterminated. 
Uh, he has guided them in all their situation because these promises have yet to be fulfilled. While the uh, New Testament makes it quite clear that the one who was spoken of, the, this unique seed that was going to come, uh, was the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the promises that God made would reach their fulfillment in his work. And that's why the New Testament opens with giving us this linkage between um, the Lord Jesus Christ and David, who God made promises to, we haven't looked at, and Abraham, showing he was a descendant of Abraham, son of Mary, but son of God. And after his crucifixion, he ascended into heaven, and the disciples saw him go into heaven, and the angels made this promise that Jesus was going to come back in like manner as they'd seen him go into heaven. And the interesting thing was that the discussion that they'd been having with the Lord Jesus just immediately prior to that, as recorded in Acts chapter 1 verse 6, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he says it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. In other words, they weren't wrong in thinking that the gospel hinges all around the kingdom of Israel. Jesus was merely saying, well, it's not for you to know when that is going to be. We know it is going to happen when the Lord Jesus comes back. And so we have seen uh, Israel is unique. That there's no other nation that's lived in their land, been scattered from it, going around the world, uh, and yet uh, after long periods been regathered to their land. Israel is unique. And we believe that this is a tremendous witness to the existence of God and the truth of the Bible. And so the final section, a couple of slides, there is to be a temple which is going to be built in Jerusalem and this is to be the centre of the world. No longer will it be the United Nations or Moscow or uh, Washington or London. Jesus as king is going to be king over the whole world. All nations will have to submit to him. And Isaiah the prophet had this wonderful picture. that It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. And shall be exalted above the hills. And all nations shall flow unto it. So when God says, I'm giving you this particular land. And when God says, I have placed Israel there in relation to all the nations. We can see what a wonderful hinge point Israel is. It's the meeting point between Africa and Europe and Asia. And nations will be able to come through the Mediterranean from North America, South America, up from Australia. Uh, that is the centre of the world. And we can see just how wonderfully God has placed them there in order that his purpose might be fulfilled. And so we see the hand of God in this nation. Terrible things yet to lie in the future, but God has given us his assurance that Israel will always be preserved. His purpose will be worked out. The Lord Jesus Christ will be king. And the wonderful message of the Bible is that we can be related to this. Because in this day, the Lord Jesus will want helpers to teach the Bible truths to the nations. And God has been calling men and women in their day and generation to put their trust in him, to believe that there is a God, that uh, this word is true. At a time when Israel wasn't a witness to them because they were scattered. Our generation has no excuse. We can see the partial fulfillment of these promises, which tells us this is a reliable book. We can trust it and we must seek out its message and make it personal to ourselves and in the mercy of God walk in ways which please the Lord God who has created all things. And so Israel is indeed an amazing witness to God's existence and the truth of the Bible. Thank you.